Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Mark, welcome to the podcast. And so good to be here. I really appreciate it, Guy. Um, good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, I love to ask everyone on the show because it gets a different answer every time, but I know you travel a lot. So if you sat to a com- next to a complete stranger on an airplane and they asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you tell them? Yeah, I tell people that I'm a trainer. I train, you know, I'm a leadership development and team trainer. Um, that's kind of close to the truth and it's, a, it's an easy conversation following that. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, because your 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 CV is so vast; it's incredible. And even just looking for this podcast today, there are so many uh, topics you could potentially tackle. Um, but the one thing that f- that fascinates me, especially coming from your background as well, is your your passion for meditation, and you've been such an advocate of it over the years as well. I forgot about that. Oh, there you go. Sorry, um, I might have been a little bit distant in those first few moments. <laughs> no, that's my fine. My microphone was a mile away from me and I was just like caught up in it. Um, I do have a passion for meditation. Um, you might be uh, recall that I started when I was 20 when I um, began a practice of Zen meditation. And that was through a martial arts program. And the, ma- the grand master of the martial arts, the founder of the martial art was also a Zen master, even though he probably never really um, identified himself as such. It was very clear that he was passionate about Zen and it was a big part of his life. And he had a small cadre of students that we we would have a class every Thursday night and sit for 45 minutes. And then I had committed to 20 minutes a day. And I pretty much kept that up. When I was in the SEAL teams, it was difficult, right, with all the missions and travel. Mm -hmm. But um, I found that the real practice is done off the mat anyways in how you orient your mind throughout the day. And so um, that's become my dominant and primary practice is off the bench practice. But I still like to sit and meditate uh, daily uh, these days still. Yeah, wonderful. And do you think um, from that meditation practice, it's really interesting because it's so subtle because I'm somebody that's a keen advocate of it, obviously myself as well. And I remember you spoke about the fact that you were, you were set up for a corporate world. You were, you were going down a certain trajectory. And I see that so often in many people's lives uh, to this mm-hmm. day. We kind of get groomed for different areas. And so often we don't question things. Right. And we go down that path. There you go. Right. Yeah. And do you think um, if it wasn't for the, the discovering that work and being attracted to work under a Zen master, that you would have continued on that path or would it have revealed itself later in life? Yeah, it, it may have, you know, the, your calling is lies within. And I think it, it knocks on the door um, constantly. And when you're ready to hear it, you'll hear it. And then you'll make a shift like you did. You know, you had your awakening experience and you sold your company and shifted everything. I was fortunate enough to have that experience when I was 20, you know, 21. It took me several years to ground myself in what I was experiencing and to really trust the vision that I was meant to be a, a, a warrior in a, in a dangerous field and not a corporate you know, bureaucrat. Um, but I think that's largely because the urgency of youth isn't as strong as it is when you're maybe in your 40s or 50s, right? Where all of a yeah. sudden mortality is staring you in the face and you're like, boy, I better get on with it and start fulfilling my mission or else I'm toast you know i mean it's too late and a lot of people actually wake up to their uh calling you know in their 30s 40s or 50s and um i would say more in the 40s and 50s and they think they've already invested so much in what it is that got them where they're at that it's too late or they they can't risk making a major shift and that's a mistake that's a mistake. And that'll lead to even a more of a midlife crisis type of situation yeah. that could lead to ill health and a real breakdown. It, you know, my f- uh, feeling is it's always, it, it is the right thing always, whenever you discover your calling to pursue it. Yeah. That's right. True fulfillment will come from and, and you're, that's how you're meant to serve, you know, the world. So if you go through life, just accumulating wealth and 
you know, wives or husbands. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of an unhappy ending. You know, we've, we've all seen that movie before. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm assuming you see a lot of that uh, with, with your work as well. People coming in and yeah. ready to make a shift at some level. Yeah, I see a lot of people who just don't know how to do it, right? They, they get this mm -hmm. sense that they're missing out on something or that they're meant for something else. And maybe even they've identified it. They just need the tools and the inspiration and the guidance to, you know, to shift and to follow a path. And that makes total sense because even all the great spiritual traditions said you, you need, there's a path and the path has certain kind of trail markers on it. But um, oftentimes it's helpful to have a guide or a Sherpa to, you know, point out when you go astray or to make sure you're on the right trail, you know, because it's different for every individual. Totally. The journey of uh, spiritual and becoming whole again is unique. It's a unique path for every, every person. There's no one way that fits, you know, you or me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I find the shifts are continuing <laughs> in my life, to be honest. With you. Did you find that for yourself as well? You know, you've, you've made this conscious decision to become a Navy SEAL. You, you, you've gone into this warrior-like environment. And were there shifts happening again after a while where you thought, you know what, it's time to actually address this and, sure. and follow another path? Yes, and I've noticed that there is kind of a dominant archetypal energy that is informing our lives. You know, for me, it's warrior. But then the way that it's expressed changes as I evolve and, huh. you know, as I get older and as I get more competent in different areas of my life. And so that, you know, when I was young in my 20s, that was like a warrior leader. And then um, 20s and the 30s and my 30s to 40s, it became more of like a warrior um, uh, strategist and entrepreneur. And now it's more of a warrior teacher and becoming more of a warrior monk, right? So, but the the underlying theme is all kind of like this warrior. I'm, I'm here as a warrior. I've actually had some pretty profound visions around that. And one of them was that I've been a warrior for many lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a lifetime that I was meant to lay down the sword, so to speak, and to be become more of the spiritual guide or teacher, you know, yeah, spiritual warrior or, or teacher, you know, or both. And, um, and that kind of has played out in my life. So it's really interesting that vision kind of came well after that was already in, underway. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what does um, uh, spirituality mean to you, Mark? I, I, I'm always fascinated to hear people's thinking behind it. Cause yeah. I think it's a word that can be said and we can bring so much different interpretation to yeah, it. Totally. Yeah. And everyone, when you say that people begin to conjure up religious symbolism and mm. thoughts about, you know, constructs like God and whatnot. And to me, it's not that. To me, it's uh, the ability to align with your um, highest and best self and serve in, um, in a meaningful way that is your calling or your, your duty. So, and that comes from your essential nature, which we, we could say is your spiritual nature. You know, some might call that your soul, some might call it your spirit or what not we don't have to get into semantics you know there's all sorts of everyone's right but everyone's also partially right you know because it's, it's beyond knowing right it's beyond our ability to truly know and anytime someone claims to know then i i get a little cringy you know because some things are just unknowable and that's one of them but my experience of it is that if you listen through meditation through insight through being quiet i call it sacred silence then you hear that inner voice, that whispering, that's telling you, go this direction. You know, go be a warrior, Mark. You're not suited to be a merchant right now. And, um, and it always speaks in very archetypal energy. It, it doesn't speak in words. It speaks in feelings. It speaks in imagery. It speaks in direct knowingness, which is like knowing something without knowing how or why you know it. You just spontaneously know it. And... So when you listen and hear that and it's pointing you a certain direction and then you also follow that guidance and suddenly everything starts to get easy and the obstacles fall away. And then you begin to live life much more authentically and, and holistically, meaning holy, like you become whole again. You're not separating from your true nature. And then when that happens, you also stop separating from other human beings. And then you become much more compassionate and inclusive. 
and you have great care and concern, and that expands even further and further. And this is, there's no there there, and you alluded to that. There, it's always changing, always expanding. As your understanding and your uh, reintegration occurs, you become more and more capable of taking perspectives and, and beginning to embrace the suffering and the disconnection that's happened and wanting to serve all human beings. And that's like the, Bod you know, the Buddhist concept of the Bodhisattva. So to me, that's what it means to be spiritual, is to align with your inner nature, your true essential nature, which is calling you in service in a certain mm -hmm. direction. And anytime you're out of alignment like that, you could say you're not living a spiritually aligned life. Yeah, it's just fantastic. It's interesting. When I started to look at the South more and in the silence and put the spotlight on my own dark areas, if you like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and see my own flaws for the good and the bad of them, it certainly, as I dealt with that more, I began to feel more connected to other people and actually see past the veil and feel the compassion underneath, just like you, you touch upon, mm -hmm. which is really important. I think so. You know, I think you could almost like summarize that all the suffering in the world is due to separation. Humans separating from themselves and then hence separating from others and separating from this vast wisdom that exists all around us that some religious traditions would call God yeah. and I will call just universal wisdom. Um, I, I don't care what you call it. You could, you could call it, you know, an iPhone if you want, it doesn't matter, right? It's not, we don't have to label it because labeling it then contracts it and, and constricts it. So let's, I prefer not to label it anyways. So yeah, yeah it's, um, but, but simple is not easy, is it? Uh, no, far from it, far from it. And, and my next question for you was, which is triggered from that, is that with that sense of connection and, and trusting, like there's a huge amount of courage and trust that goes into allowing mm -hmm. this self to evolve. And then mm -hmm. how do you view the challenges that then come your way in life? Because challenges cannot quite often make or break us. But mm -hmm. what I'm finding on my personal journey is from having that, stronger sense of self and, and from this work is allowing me to look at these things slightly differently to me, how I would have maybe five, even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the challenges are welcome because they're, that's where you're going to find your greatest learning and your growth. And if you shy from the challenge, um, A, you won't grow and B, it's not going to stop them from coming. They'll keep coming. And so, we prefer, I prefer to train for the challenge by uh, taking on challenges in controlled environments. You know, that's what my whole seal fit business is built upon. Mm -hmm. It's like try to build this most extreme challenge in a controlled environment so that when you uh, develop the mental and emotional skills to navigate that gracefully, then all other challenges that come at you um, begin to become much more navigable and you embrace the, the suck of them and you go into them with a clear-eyed and uh, calm uh, approach to, to see where the learning is and see what lesson you're supposed to get out of that challenge. And so you don't, um, sh you end up really enjoying the fact that challenge is part of our human experience and that we grow from it, right? Yeah. So you, you look forward to them, actually. You look forward to the growth. Yeah. And you couldn't imagine a life where everything was easy. I'm not saying, you know, we don't enjoy and embrace um, the benefits of hard work through maybe taking time off or, you know, celebration. We want to do that. Otherwise, you know, you might break down if everything is all push, push, push against the next challenge. So we want to have that balance between uh, effort and surrender. But um, if it's all, if it's all easy and if you're, all you do is avoid, you know, the, the hard work and the challenges, then you end up uh, locking yourself in a prison of mediocrity and weakness and that's not good and we i think there's a lot of people in the world who are doubly suffering because a human existence is about sep you know separates and leads to suffering and then we lock ourselves in this prison of mediocrity and weakness because we avoid the challenges we run from them instead of toward them yeah absolutely Same the, the the thing that, which leads into this as well and um because i think we are quite often frightened to fail Mm -hmm. when we want to move forward and, and move these things and, and failure, the thought of failure can often hold us back. But like you say, if you create environments where you're putting yourself in challenges in the training ground that, that translate into real life. And I was fascinated to, to hear about your transition out of the, the seals back into 
into being a civilian, if you like. And you talked about a brewery company and the fact that it kind of wasn't resonating with you in alignment. And I thought that might be nice to touch upon as well, because um, I've certainly done things and, and failed at them. Mm -hmm. But there's always been great lessons that have come from it that align me more to my path. Yeah. And, and entrepreneurism can be a great slap in the face um, to help you understand that, you know, the business that you start or, or you align around, it's, you know, it's got to be aligned with your life purpose or else you end up really struggling sometimes with it. And that was what happened with the Coronado Brewing Company. I was getting off active duty and I wanted to start a business. And I went, so I decided to go into business with my brother-in-law, which right there, is, you know, has a little bit of a minefield attached to it. And, um, and I didn't really know him well. And then he brought in his brother and I, I didn't put up any protests, which was my codependence and, and fear of confrontation. And so I just allowed it to happen. And all of a sudden my ownership stake was cut by, you know, from 50% to 33%. And then of course we diluted it by raising all the money, which I raised all the money. And I did basically mm -hmm. all the early work of getting the business, the brewing company, Coronado Brewing Company was called up and running and profitable. And um, my partners ended up basically reneging on most of their commitments, if not all. One of their commitments was that we're going to put, all put in $25,000 seed capital. I put in mine and they didn't put in theirs. And I didn't protest. I wasn't happy, but I didn't protest. Meaning, you know, a normal entrepreneur would protest by saying, you're out of the partnership, you know, <laughs> this is done. And I just allowed it to slide. And they were going to quit their jobs and work full time. Neither of them did that. And yet they would come in at like beer 30 and give away three or four hundred dollars worth of beer and food every night. Right. And, uh, and yet they insisted on having equal decision making power. And it just got uglier and uglier from there. And finally, I brought it to the board of directors attention that this thing wasn't going so well. And that made things worse because then all of a sudden um, the board alerted them. And, you know, instead of cleaning it up, it turned into a three year legal battle for control of the business, you know, shareholder proxy battles and everything. And I won all those on the fact that, you know, I was president and the company was profitable and growing and all the investors had invested in me along with the idea, you know, Navy SEAL, MBA, CPA, I put all my money in. A lot of the investors were family and friends. So we won all those proxy battles and we were winning the outer surface level fight, but I was losing the fight internally because I was losing any kind of passion or motivation for the business. And my wife was getting just hounded and attacked relentlessly by the family, by you know her brothers and her mother. Wow. And her mother and father got divorced and it just got really ugly. So um, my wife Sandy was kind of begging me to just walk away from the business. And I understood that uh, even though my ego was wrapped up in it. So in instead of walking away, I organized a buyout and had my brothers-in-law buy me out and buy any part, you know, any other of the, of the investors who got in, you know, supporting me got out as well. It was, it was a hard pill to swallow because I had built this $10 million really profitable business that these guys had no business owning and yet they owned it, you know? And I, so I gave them basically this massive retirement plan on a platter and the business has really succeeded since then. You know, they didn't, they didn't mess it up too much. And um, that's worth about probably 50, hundred million dollars now that is. And I, you know, I saw nothing out of that. So it was a real lesson in emotional awareness, um, legal, you know, that's my legal, yeah. oh. my legal degree, my emotional degree. And, but the biggest lesson uh, related to what we were talking about was after that, it was very clear to me that after I got, I got smacked down that I was not in that business for the right reasons. I was doing it for the money. I was mm -hmm. doing it because I thought it'd be cool to own a brewery and to have all that free beer. And you know what I mean? That we could be the big fellows in town. Horrible reasons to be in business. And so after that, I really committed that any business that I uh, built was going to be much more aligned with what I considered to be my main calling as a warrior teacher now. And so that's why you saw, you know, seal fit is all about teaching people how to be mentally tough and resilient leaders and great teammates and unbeatable is all about leading and coaching teams to find their elite um, operating you know, mode. And Kokoro yoga is about um, a personal practice of integration. So I feel aligned now and that if I hadn't had that really painful 
lesson, that first entrepreneurial lesson, I'm not sure. It might have taken me longer. You know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's important. Sure. Um, what I, you mentioned Kokori Yoga as well. Where did your passion for yoga come from? That fascinated me as well, especially coming from your background as a Navy yeah. SEAL. Well, it started with the martial arts. So I was a martial artist, black belt in karate and Zen uh, practitioner for four mm. years before I joined the SEALs. Um, when I got off active duty in, in the SEALs, we didn't have time. I studied uh, Sansu Kung Fu, which we called SCARS, and I was a certified uh, military instructor in that. But you know, I didn't really have time beyond that to practice the martial art because we were always somewhere else, right? We were gone 11 months out of the year. But when I got off active duty and kind of settled down again, I got back into karate. I got a, a, another black belt in Goju Ryu. And then I found um, a ninjutsu program and I was working up toward my black belt. I was running the cusp of getting my black belt in ninjutsu when the uh, instructor uh, shut the school down. He wasn't a great business guy, but he was a great martial artist. And, um, and so I was looking around for what's next. And there was very little martial arts in my uh, AO in northern, uh, northern San Diego. But there was a yoga studio right down the road from me, literally within you know a few hundred yards and it was bikram's yoga and so oh, wow. they had they had a 60-day challenge well they had a 30-day challenge which i did back to back where you do a, a class every day so i did 60 days non-stop every day a hot yoga class <laughs> the end of that 60 days i felt terrific and i never wanted to step foot in the bikram's yoga studio again in my life <laughs> and i haven't and um but it, it sparked this interest in yoga. And I recognized that the martial arts and yoga had a lot in common. And someone told me about Ashtanga yoga, which was uh, founded by Patabi Joyce and was used to train uh, warriors in India. And it's a very rigorous style of yoga that actually has a leveling system, sort of like getting a belt ranking. I thought, hey, that, that might be what I'm looking for. So I started studying Ashtanga yoga and took some teacher training in that. And that led me to find a incredible book called the autobiography of a yogi by paramahansa yogananda and when i read that it just cracked me wide open because this was like true yoga i was looking at yoga more like a physical practice mm -hmm. and i started to understand that yoga is a, a, it's the science of mental development mental and spiritual development and the physical part is just a way or mechanism to make sure that your body holds up during your journey and I was like, wow, that's interesting. So that led me on this unbelievably deep quest that continues to this day to read everything I could find from all the ancient texts and every, uh, you know, every um, interpretation of the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And then I gotten into Tibetan Buddhism and Zajin and both practice and, and, um, and reading. And I recognize that they're all talking about the same thing. Right? Whether it's yoga or the martial arts or a spiritual practice like Tibetan meditation, it's all about evolution, what we started talking about. It's all about the human being taking responsibility to evolve themselves, to unlock their massive potential, their fullest potential, and to serve. And some way, you know, and there's, there's a myriad of cultural nuances to that, and there's a myriad of disagreements over things like duality and non-duality or, you know, both the nature of reality, the nature of God or Brahman, you know, all this stuff. And people have argued and killed each other over that stuff. <laughs> and none of it really matters because the answer is something else anyways. Like we talked about, these are all just human beings trying to interpret something that's vastly uh, vast and not easy to even put words around. And the minute you put a word on it, you, yeah, you contract it. Mm -hmm. And so the wisest leaders recognize this, wisest, wisest teachers recognize this and, and, and point to the fact that this is a very personal journey. And so you don't need all those wisdom texts. They're, they're good to get you motivated and get you started on your path. But ultimately, it's about your own exploration. Having said that, it is helpful, and I mentioned this earlier, to have a teacher keep you on track because sometimes, you know, we can wander off the trail and you know suddenly we're like facing a cliff and we don't know which way to go we don't know you know whether we turn around and go back because that seems like retreating or do we scale the cliff so we avoid that by um you know tra traveling the path skillfully 
and a teacher can help us travel a path skillfully. You know, you mentioned uh, before we talked about a Kundalini awakening. Yeah. This is, this is an experience that has really tripped a lot of people up in the West. Um, Kriya yoga, Kundalini yoga, you know, working with the energy bodies and energy system is important work, but it's, it was never um, taught as like the place to start. It was really a more advanced practice. There's a lot of preparation that went in to be able to hold that energy, um, allow the energy to, to ascend properly and then to integrate and descend properly. And there have been some seriously big blow ups with people in the West who went deep into Kundalini yoga without any preparatory practice or maybe they needed to work on just some simple breath control practice to, to stabilize their mind before they did that. And then, you know, literally they fried their circuitry <laughs> by releasing all the energy uh, too quickly. Does that ring that. true to you? Right. <laughs> I, um, I mean, I was ready. In all honesty, I was ready. I'd been doing a lot of the work. I was prepared. But I wasn't, nothing can prepare you for that. To, for something like that. The, the, the voltage of energy that went through my body was so intense, all my arms had curled in because the, the energy was coming up the spine, it was going down my arms, mm -hmm. I could feel it coming up my hands and everything was spasming. And right. it was just, and it, but, but what's really fascinates me around this in the nervous system is that the nervous system has been adapting ever since. So mm -hmm. it, there's an adaptation that starts it to- cha It changes you from the inside out. Does it yeah. Change you from you know, and, and then, but once you have those experience and, and it was like being able to have embodied experiences along the way, I resonate with everything you said about, um, you know, you have guides and the Sherpas to, to show you, but, and all the textbooks in the world you can read, but until you start putting it into practice. Yeah, it's, it's meaningless. It's meaningless, yeah. But the, the other thing is, it's one thing you can get from, you can get a warning like from, the yoga sutras from the text to say, Hey, you know, don't get, don't get stuck in the experience of joy or bliss or the light, you know, from Kundalini awakening, because that's an obstacle. The experience itself is just your experience. Let it pass. And don't think that's the, that's it. Don't, don't keep striving to repeat an experience. That's an obstacle. And a lot of people are that, you know, are, are like peak state or flow state junkies and they, they think that is spiritual practice or like uh, ayahuasca journey junkies mm. where they think that just that's it. And it's not it. That's just an experience that, that, that shows you that, Hey, the subtle realm has all sorts of, you know, ways that energy can express itself through imagery and through sensations and bliss and even pain and suffering. And all of those are just experiences. So keep moving through and move beyond. Don't, don't get stuck trying to repeat those experiences and, and think that that's, the same as awakened awareness or enlightenment. Yeah. It's not. It's not. And so a good teacher can help you make sure you don't get stuck at one of these, you know, false plateaus. 100%. I think by chasing that, it, it still keeps you avoiding the very things that you need to look at within yourself. Absolutely. And that's the emotional development. To me, I think one of the biggest areas for spiritual development that gets ignored is the emotional development. And so more, many spiritual teachers are finally acknowledging that. And uh, like John Kabat-Zinn, who brought mindfulness to the United States, you know, he, he wrote a book, this is After Enlightenment, Take Out the Trash. And what he meant by that is, you know, it, you can achieve great states of um, mental awareness and still be stuck in a low stage of development because your emotional shadow, shadow hasn't been cleared up and it's keeping you stuck. And, and one of my mentors, Ken Wilbur, says, you know, we've got to endeavor to wake up and grow up. So we wake up by, you know, through the process of meditation and awakening to our true nature, our true self. But then we grow up to higher stages of perspective taking, you know, uh, which have been mapped out through uh, transpersonal psychology and developmental psychology. And then we also have to clean up that if we clean up our emotional baggage. And only if we do all three of those can we show up fully integrated as a you know whole human being and a lot of people just focus on waking up that's it and they think that's it I don't, I don't, you know in books there's yeah. tons of books written about awakening and everyone thinks that's the holy grail when the reality is it's just one third of the equation totally you know up, growing up and showing, uh, cleaning up properly. yeah I, I a mentor said to me once he said guy the um true meditation is what you do with your eyes open during your day that's right 
And it's uh, off the mat, like I was talking about earlier, yeah. the work is off the mat. It's in relationships and crucial conversations and maintaining presence with your kids and your, your spouse and um, your team and learning to detach from the emotional roller coaster and from the thought structures that um, contract, contract our ego into, you know, um, these identity structures that are necessarily real, not in the um, spiritual sense. They're, they're just egoic structures that we tend to mistake as real. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, before we move on, I want to touch on your book as well. And uh, you've got a new book out, Staring Down the Wolf. And uh, I was interested, why wolf? What does that represent? I obviously have some sort of archetypal energy around the wolf because it keeps coming up in my life. And it's on the cover of my book, Unbeatable Mind. <laughs> so the, the title came from the cover of that book. Okay. Originally, I was calling the book The Seven Commitments That Forge Elite Teams. It's kind of like formulaic, like, like Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, um, and I wasn't thinking of calling it Staring Down the Wolf. I didn't, it didn't even enter my mind, but I had hired an a editor to help me with um, f helping me formulate some of the early chapters. You know, the way that I work best is I can, you know, come up with the ideas and I, I can make like a six or seven page bullet of each chapter. And I can actually sit down and write, but I get more done more quickly on, in this process that I'm describing. So I'll, I'll formulate the overall architecture of the book. I'll formulate each chapter and then I'll, um, I have a, a writer who interviews me, transcribes it and then, you know, formulates that into a first draft. And then I take it from there. It, it's very helpful for me to, most of the work in writing is in editing. So if yeah. you could just get, you know, words on the paper, even if in the editing process, I think practically every single word changed, you know, it's hard work, the editing that's for, you know, so I've heard, it's, yeah. It's, three or four uh, edits after that, every single word from those first drafts changed, but the overall structure of the book didn't. At any rate, this guy turned it around and when he turned it around, he had a title on the outside and he never told me about it, but the title was Staring Down the Wolf. And then he called me and he says, what do you think? I said, you mean the title, right? Not the writing? He goes, yeah. I was like, oh man. He goes, I, I said, I love it, but wow, it's gonna change the book because now I've got to go in and explain in a, like an introduction, a whole introductory chapter. What, is, what do I mean? And then I got to contextualize that throughout the book, hmm. which is what I did. And it, and it lengthened the process by about six months. Oh, wow. So what does it mean? Um, it's a reference to the native American or probably not just a native American, but native tradition that there's uh, two wolves that reside in this. One is the wolf of fear who resides in our brain and then the wolf of courage who resides in our heart. That makes sense because courage means heart, like the French root of core, C-O-U-R, is heart. So courage means acting with heart. At any rate, so the legend goes that um, the wolf of fear feeds on negativity and fear, and the wolf of courage feeds on love and positivity, and the wolf that you feed the most is the one that will dominate your life. And here's the irony. If you don't do anything the wolf of fear gets fed anyways because there's so much negativity in the world and the brain is wired to be negative. They call it negativity bias. It's got five times as much negative processing and looping than it does positive. And so if you do nothing, if you take no action, then you'll, uh, you'll be feeding the fear wolf and you'll be negative even if you put a happy glad wrapper on top of that. And we see that all the time in our world, right? <laughs> and the negativity shows up through, you know, anxiety, anger, judgment, righteousness, you know, shadow, you know, emotional shadow. So what you have to do is interdict that negativity and begin to starve it, starve the fear wolf and tap into your courage wolf by connecting to your heart and feeding your heart with deep felt connection with other human beings compassion, you know, positive internal dialogue and positive emotional, you know, uh, anchoring where you have to like fake it till you make it sometimes, especially if you're not feeling good. And also just an awareness that the human condition does include a, a fair amount of suffering like we've talked about. And but that suffering is largely related to our attachment, attachment to our physical body, attachment to our life, attachment to our material things, attachment to our the people in our lives. 
And so one of the great uh, practices that I work on is non-attachment. And it's, that's part of my practice off the mat is practicing non-attachment, which helps me um, move toward courage and away from fear. So mm -hmm. that's uh, the book staring on the wolf is interesting because it's got these really powerful commitments that an, a leader and, and their team can use as daily practices to forge things like courage, trust, respect, growth, excellence, resiliency, and alignment. Those are the seven commitments. But I also uh, go into detail on what holds us back from those, the, the fears and the shadows and my own failures as examples, like the Coronado Brewing Company yeah. was a good example where I fell down in courage because I didn't have the courage to have the crucial conversations with my partners. And I have the courage to say no to my partner about bringing in his brother and deluding myself. And he ended up being the real negative Millie. And so uh, I didn't have, I didn't know where I stood. I didn't have a stand around these things. And so I had to learn that part of developing courage is to take a stand for things that are really important to you and be willing to stand your ground in spite of the consequences. So I learned courage, not through SEAL training, but through failing in my first business venture. And I, I have great respect for entrepreneurs because, you know, to be honest, it's, it's easier to lead a SEAL team than it is to build a business in my wow. business, in my opinion. And I've done both. Yeah. So wow. in SEAL it, teams, it, it's kind of done for you. You know, you're handed this, this, you know, team of hardcore operators who's been through a minimum three years of training and they're the, the 5% that made it through. And, and the structure of the team is just ridiculously solid and you got this massive budget and a very clear mission. And, you know, the culture is one of, you know, high performance accomplishment. Wouldn't every entrepreneur love to have all that energy behind their back? You know totally. I mean? Yeah. But, but, but Mark, what's clear to me as well, listening to you speak is, is um, how open you are about your failings and vulnerable yeah. and, that's such a that's such a big thing, and so often we we we're frightened to go there and talk about our failings in life, and yeah. um, but you know it it inspires change. Really I agree. Does. Nobody's perfect, and that's one of the one of the masks of fear is to not is to um, be seen as imperfect. But you know that's a weakness. Actually, projecting perfectionism is a weakness because nobody's perfect. Nobody has all the answers. No leader gets things done alone. So when leaders can develop that authenticity and that humility to recognize that they need their team, and oftentimes they're the limiting factor in their team's success because they shut down the energy of the team. When they can get out of their own way, take off those masks of perfectionism and absolutism and judgment and righteousness and all that kind of stuff, well, however it shows up, or even if it's just the energy of, um, non not being you know not trusting everyone trusting your own you know like my way the highway or you know i'm the one with all the brilliant ideas because i'm the entrepreneur and then, you know your team feels that and then they get shut down because they don't think they have a voice or their ideas don't count or whatever when you can get out of your own way and when you can stare down your wolf of fear in whatever form it takes then you get out of your own way and you show up authentically with your team and your team resonates with that and then the team together uh with you will um transform the work environment into a, an accelerated growth environment. So every day you show up, you're, you know, you're excited to be there and yeah. you're excited to grow together. And then all of a sudden magic happens, right? 20 times potential comes out of that. In my opinion, I've seen that with a lot of clients I work with. Yeah. Fantastic. When's the book due out, Mark? It came out last week. In the States. Yeah, it okay. came out last week and it's selling very well. I mean, geez, we, we sold 10,000 copies in the first week. Oh, wow. Congratulations. And, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're off to the races and, and getting great feedback. And it was a little scary for me for that reason that you stated. You know, I, I did, like, I, I put up some military SEAL spec ops leaders to, to demonstrate the principle, let's say, of courage or trust or respect in action. And then I have a story about me, how I literally fell on my face and bloodied my nose, and, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And blew the, the principle. But uh, throughout the book, as we get more and more toward the final um, commitments of resiliency and alignment, then you see how I've been able to, you know, learn from my mistakes and kind of begin to integrate all these commitments into my own life and my own business to now where our business really is an exemplar. And, you know, we still uh, have our struggles and everything, but we really are committed to all those seven commitments. They're baked into the values of our company and 
we've got clients now who are really embracing them and, and having great success with them. Yeah, brilliant, Mark. I was going to say, because they, they, to help me prepare for the podcast, they sent me a PDF version of the book. And, oh, great. And, and that was the first thing I connected to when I, when I read about your brewery. And I was like, that's amazing. That's awesome. Hence why I brought it up. But um, I'll be sure to order a hard copy, that's for sure. Um, Thanks. I ask a couple of questions to wrap up every show. And um, what's your morning routine look like? Wow. I tell you, the morning routine for me is probably the most important part of the mm. day. You know, I call it the time where I win in my mind before I step in the battlefield, step foot in the battlefield. So um, I'll just specifically go through it. I, I wake up and I begin uh, a, a two-part practice of box breathing and gratitude, which is like positivity. So I just begin to train my, you know, and train my mind with positive statements, a mantra that I have, several of them. And then I, and I control my breathing through this box breathing practice, which is a core practice of my unbeatable mind training. I'll do that for about uh, five to 10 minutes. And then I'll go use the restroom, drink some fresh water to, you know, recharge the battery and to flush out the system and, you know, uh, detox a little bit. And then I'll begin my, um, the next phase of my practice, which is basically mindful awareness. So I've got um, a, a bunch of, things that I reflect upon and they're all written down. So I reflect upon a bunch of uh, things that I want to be grateful for. I've got some, um, you know, some, not, I wouldn't say they're scriptural things, but some um, poetic things that I read like St. Francis prayer. And these are things just to like constantly refine the quality of my uh, mental processing. Mm -hmm. I have my vision and my mission and my values and um, uh, an articulation of the future version of myself that I'm becoming, all that is written down. And I, and I read it silently to myself while I'm breathing deeply and reflecting on it and I'm visualizing it, right? So I'll do that. And then I'll go into my formal meditation practice. And before I do that, I do some movement. And so I'll do some yoga about five, 10, 15 minutes of yoga. And I have some Kundalini breathing and, you know, like cat cow type things. And, you know, I do the Tibetan seven, or the Tibetan rites, which are uh, six different like yoga poses that you use with the breath. And that gets me uh, really, really ready to uh, sit. And then I sit in silence and I do my silence is a, or my meditation is a three part practice. It starts with breath, uh, control and then uh, concentrating on the breath in a concentration practice and then i release the concentration and um, shift into the awakened awareness state and stay try to work on stabilizing that and that's where i'm at working on stabilizing awakened awareness which is beyond the structures of the self and working on seeing everything that arises in that space as empty of any type of grab empty of any type of tr uh, trigger or anything like that. It just is, mm -hmm. right? Things just yeah. arise. And then that's where it ends. I will leave that practice and try to maintain that throughout the day. And I have to occasionally remind myself and come back. And I do that with little spot drills. But that's the core morning practice. After that, I'll have a smoothie where I put some, my, some ample with uh, uh, some you know, fruits and veggies and have a delicious smoothie. Now, this is on a perfect day, which ends up being about five, four, four to five days a week. There's two days, which are still perfect days, where I get up early and go uh, to my Aikido studio to study Aikido. Uh -huh. And that's a 5 a.m. wake up, so I don't have the time to go through that whole ritual. Yeah. So I, I end up getting it in later in the day. And it's not as, um, I'm, I'm not able to do it in as pure a form because of, you know, the distractions and the, and the places that I end up doing it. But I endeavor to get most of that in later yeah. in the day. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I bet you're disciplined with your sleep as well. I, to, yeah, I try to, to get to bed that. before, you know, around 9.30 sometimes. Yeah. It pushes to 10 and I endeavor to get seven hours at least every night. Yeah. I think yeah. sleep is so important, Guy. It's one of the, it's, huge, it's a treasure it? trove, you know, of opportunity for people who aren't getting sleep. Start there almost, right? Because yeah, your body's always going to be out of balance if you're not sleeping well. Yeah. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone from anywhere in the world in any time frame, a couple of people and have dinner and have a conversation with them, who do you think it would be and why? Anyone spring to mind? You know, um, 
and my wife and kid. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm, I'm kind of antisocial. I've found that, you know, every human being is pretty much the, has the same, you know, fears and the same stuff. And, and I've, I've been around so many spiritual leaders and I found, you know, that they're, it's interesting, but you know, yeah, time is, time is precious. I'd much rather spend time, you know, with immediately immediate family and people that I deeply love and care for because you never know might be my last opportunity. Yeah. Beautiful I learned that as a warrior, right? Every day is precious, so don't take it lightly. Mm. I have many, many, many friends who would love to be sitting here having this conversation with us, but they weren't given the opportunity because they gave their lives. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And last thing, with everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners to ponder on? Yeah, get comfortable with silence. You know, the, the answers are all there. <laughs> Stop looking for them outside ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Who you are. Absolutely. Where, where can I send people, Mark, if they want to grab a copy of your book, if they want to learn more about your website? Yeah, the, if Staring Down the Wolf sounded interesting to you, then it's worth going to our website for it, which is staringdownthewolf.com. Because we have a free um, training on the seven principles there that would be useful as, a, as an additional tool, especially for people who like to watch videos for training or for learning. So staringdownthewolf.com, we will ask you for your email. That's it. Otherwise, it's free. Um, my personal website, markdivine.com, has information on my podcast. Actually, I have a popular podcast called The Unbeatable Absolutely. Mind Podcast. Yeah. And a blog and um, also information about speaking engagements and whatnot. And also the social media channels, if anyone wants to follow me on Instagram, like Real Mark Devine is my social media channel. If anyone's interested in the um, leadership and team development uh, of the integration program, we call the Unbeatable Mind, that's the website, unbeatablemind.com. And any warriors or athletes who are listening who'd like to challenge themselves beyond measure, sealfit.com is our challenge company. And we have these intense, awesome crucibles. We have tons and tons of Australians come up and tackle those crucible events. Oh, wow. we have one that's 50 hours nonstop physical, mental, emotional team training called Kokoro Camp. Kokoro means merge your heart and mind into your actions. I think you should do that, Guy. I think you should put that on your to-do list. Put on my to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely consider it, that's for sure. Okay, good. Good answer. <laughs> I'll be sure to link uh, everything in the show notes, Mark. And do, do, do you ever come to Australia? Do, do you ever come over here and speak at all? Or? Um, I have not, but I would be open to it someday. You know, I, I look forward to it. It's hard to, um, I'm so busy, right? And I, mm -hmm. I get requests and it's just difficult to put an overseas event together. You know, I found, uh, but I did an event in Germany over the holidays. Um, okay. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible. So. Yeah, well, you have a lot going on. And uh, I really- opportunities and we'll talk about it. Yeah, I really appreciate your time today, Mark. Uh, that was phenomenal and I appreciate everything you do and put out there to the world. You've certainly inspired my own journey over the years as well. So I'm just happy to be able to share it with my audience today and uh, appreciate everything. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Guy. I really appreciate it. It's always an honor to be able to share ideas like this. Yeah, so keep doing what you're doing. Who you are. I shall. Thanks, Mark.